prehistoric Michigan trails that we still follow today by Dennis M. Morrison. In many of my videos, I have told you about the Old Vinetton Creek site in Oscoda, Michigan. This was a multi-component site with a small middle woodland horizon and an extensive late woodland occupation. Often as I was walking the trails at this site, I got the feeling that I was following in ancient footpaths. Then as I discovered where the uh, lodges and work areas were, it became apparent that indeed these trails today were the same ones walked so long ago. In many places throughout the state, our roadways follow the trails that were well established by the Native American people many centuries ago. Often I turn to the writing of W.B. Hinsdale because of his insight into prehistoric ancient Michigan, and I'd like to do that again. Um, I would like to begin by quoting, reading to you from Mr. Hindale's book, Primitive Man in Michigan, particularly a chapter um, titled Trails and Sites. Hinsdale wrote the following. The trails or paths that the Indians habitually took in going from place to place are among the most valuable relics of their times. They are as interesting to study and trace as earthworks and village sites are. Historically, <clears throat> they are of particular importance because uh, very many of them are, were followed by the first white settlers and finally became r main roads and routes of travel. Only seldom is it possible to find the real foot-worn track through the woods, but traces of trails that were followed can be made out for miles sometimes by the old surveys and from the records left by early writers. The trunk lines from Detroit to Chicago, from Detroit to Saginaw, and from Grand Rapids to St. Joseph are illustrations of the conversion of trails into modern improved roads. Of course, as the roads are straightened, they depart from the original traces, but the general lines of direction are very close to the pathways the Indians trod for unnumbered years. In regard to the origin of these trails, the Handbook of American Indians, Bureau of American Ethnology, says, Supplemental, however, to these open and in times of war obviously dangerous routes, meaning waterways, were paths or trails, many of them originally made by the tracks of deer or buffalo in their seasonal migrations between feeding grounds or in search of water or salt licks. The constant passing over the same path year after year and generation after generation often so packed the soil that in places, especially on hillsides, the paths are still traceable by depressions in the grounds or by the absence of or the difference in vegetation. Some of the principal trackways were um, double paths, probably due to the original becoming so deep and worn as to be unserviceable in wet weather. Indians were migratory and went on long tramps, often coming back to the place of their departure. Time was no object. Sometimes they made amazingly long journeys for the purpose of trade, to visit other tribes, or to attend councils, or for making war. Under movement, a group would march one behind another, hence our expression, Indian file. In the selection of the route, the Aborigine generally showed rare good judgment. He avoided steep um, declivities. He took the shortest feasible cut, came in contact with rivers at the best fording places, and if possible, avoided stony, rough ground, briar thickets, and places of dense bush. High ground that was normally dry was generally selected. In mountainous country, traveling bands followed the valleys and knew all the gaps. In fine, from a topographical standpoint, their route was such as an engineer would select if he were not hampered by the government system of rectangular surveys. There was a noticeable trail from where Detroit now stands to the lower end of Lake Michigan and thence <clears throat> up the western shore <clears throat> of that lake to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Another great double trail commenced at what is now Toledo, Ohio, diagonally transversed the lower peninsula, passing several miles east of Kalamazoo through Grand Rapids and thence <clears throat> to, the, to the Straits of Mackinac. Another trail leading to the crossing of the Straits from the south started from Detroit, passed through Saginaw, and followed north, northerly along the west shore of Lake Huron. There were secondary trails 
<clears throat> angling into the great trails, uh, trails like feeders. And besides the many main trails and their very numerous collaterals, there were hundreds of local paths leading from village to village, to hunting and fishing grounds, to cornfields, etc. The Indian's trail was the pioneer's first highway. Those trails that became permanent roads can generally be identified by their disregard for the points of the compass. A highway that deviates greatly from the um, section lines will bear investigation to determine if it were not formally an Indian path. For those who may wish to study trails, it will be of interest to know that the former locations of these ancient highways can still be traced, so that oftentimes a credible map of them may be constructed. There are numerous sources from which information may be obtained. The first, and probably the most trustworthy source, is the field records of the United States surveys. A deputy U.S. surveyor was instructed to note all Indian trails, their bearing, and also any Indian villages. A copy of these records is supposed to be on file in the Office of the Register of Deeds for each county, but one will generally find such records in the Office of the County Surveyor. There are two sets of surveys to be consulted, one made by the surveyor who ran the, the section and what is known as the interior lines. It frequent, frequently transpires that some of the early surveyors did not comply with the law in noting this data. In platting <clears throat> the distances which are in the chains and lengths, generally one cannot obtain a suitable scale. In order to reduce to feet, um, uh, treat the links as a decimal of a chain and multiply by 66. This will enable one to locate, locate the point on a map. Now, <clears throat> Mr. S um, uh, Hinsdale continued on uh, in a fascinating discourse about the trails um, in a little more detail in his book, um, The First Peoples of Michigan. And I'd like to, uh, to read a little to you from that wonderful old book. Mr. Hinsdale wrote, What has been said must have convinced the reader that the Indians traveled considerably and that communication was not more developed than is perhaps commonly supposed. The Indian had no draft animal except the dog and, um, <clears throat> and no wheeled um, vehicle, but he was strong and endured to and endured to outdoor life and traveled long distances both by canoe and on foot. As with the waterways, he used the trails in war, in trade, in the hunt, and for various other purposes. For local visiting, we may suppose uh, to general wanderlust. In the course of events, some trails became specialized as war trails, trade, or hunting routes, and these uses, linking up with the general ge geographical and cultural situation, were important thereafter as determiners of the social process. The Indian was not, in all cases, the first or only one to locate the paths. Deer and buffalo also had the uh, habitat, habit of filing through the forest and across the openings, with an instinct no less shrewd than that displayed on the Highland Trail. The buffalo and the Indian found with great sagacity the best crossing places over the streams of America. Many of our substantial and costly bridges are built over streams at places the Indians had located as the most feasible crossing points. By trial and error, the large ruminants and Indians uh, chose the best possible paths, avoiding obstructions and mire and selecting hard ground, not failing by almost an uncanny cunning to come out at the point aimed for. These were not blazed trails. Blazing was a white man's invention. The Indian had other and just as unfailing signs for picking the way. Blazing is a uh, giving away of the secrets of the woods. Many of our present day roads are built over these ancient traces. Those that do not follow the point of the compass, uh, that turn and slant by diagonals and wind with curves for long distances are generally pursuing courses of the old trails. The stages of change have been about as follows. The Indians' narrow footpaths, cleared road, corduroy road, dirt road, gravel pike, cement highway, a few went through the stage of planking, too. Whatever their present appearance, these avenues are no more important to our culture than were the deep-worn paths trod by human feet long before a horse or wheeled vehicle entered the country. 
Roads are an indication of the state of culture, of the society, of the community at work. Indian trails had a function and purpose, just <clears throat> as had Whittier's old roads winding as old roads well, here to a ferry and there to a mill. <clears throat> the Michigan to Tidewater Trails Any understanding of the situation as regards uh, Indian trails in Michigan depends upon some comprehension of the larger communicative that complexes. It may now be shown that almost the entire country was crossed by great paths and that the Michigan trails artificially divided in our minds by our system of geographical divisions are but a part of the larger network. We may look briefly at some of these larger routes of trade and travel before going into detail as regards of our local situation. The Great Trail a most important line of travel coming into Michigan now paralleled by great arteries of commerce was the Great Trail, probably so designated because of its special importance to the Indians and pioneer affairs. Its eastern branches came from the country around Chesapeake and Delaware Bays. It connected with two or three branches as it bent around the west end of Lake Erie with the Sauk or Chicago Trail. This was a continuous path between Tidewater and the Great Lakes. Over it, in prehistoric and historic times, traveled men, savage and civilized, upon missions of vital importance in their domestic and political affairs. For uncounted years, moccasin-footed Indians, the Indians upon ponies, soldiers mounted and on foot, pioneers with ox teams, and travelers in stagecoaches, all upon some mission or other, war, adventure, trade, chase, exploration, home-seeking, passed over this trail. From the east, the trail came to the junction of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers, which formed the Ohio, where Fort Pitt and afterwards Pittsburgh were built. From this point, the trail extended to the Ohio border, entering the state very near the southeast corner of Columbian, or excuse me, Columbiana County. It struck almost due west to the south border of Stark County and forded the Tuscaroras at the site of the old Fort Lawrence. Thence it went westerly to Mohican Johnstown in Ashland County. A few miles west of there it went northwesterly passing Sandusky Bay uh, to Perrysburg at the Maumee Ra Rapids. One branch extended west from this ford on the, on the Maumee River deflected northwest and entered Michigan at the southwest corner of Seneca Township, Leelanau County, where Morency is now situated. This branch trail continued northwest to the village of Allen, Hillsdale County, where it joined the, the main Chicago Trail. The main track of the Great Trail bent north through where Port Lawrence, now Toledo, stood. A branch forked off to Monroe and followed the River Raisin to the, to the Macon Reservation in central Monroe County and from there went up to Saline River to the Salt Springs in Washtenaw County. There it connected with the Chicago Trail. Several other well-trodden paths particularly um, paralleled these branches from the, from the Great to the Chicago Trail. The main Great Trail continued north from Monroe through Flat Rock and Brownstown to the crossing at Detroit. From there onto the Straits, it was called the Saginaw and Mackinac Trail. The old maps do not agree as to the exact course of the Great Trail um, took it in the vicinity of Toledo. No doubt the Black Swamp, which extended along the lower reaches of the Maumee River for many miles at different seasons according as the water was high or low, made detours necessary. The Shore Trail. The Shore Trail, as it is known historically, followed the southern shore of Lake Erie going east from the various Michigan trails that converged at Toledo. It paralleled the Great Trail to Sandusky Bay where, two, where the two met and parted. The Shore Trail then led to Erie, Pennsylvania and to Buffalo and Niagara, New York. In western New York, the same kind of branching of the main trail uh, that existed at the western end made connections with various points in the Iroquoian uh, territory. The direct Iroquois Trail followed down the Mohawk River to the Hudson. There were trails leading east from the Hudson River to Massachusetts Bay. The Shore Trail led through bloody country, the country that had been held by the unfortunate Erie or Cat tribe who were virtually exterminated by the Five Nations, their own near relatives. The highway from Cleveland and other cities of the Lake Erie Shore follows closely the Old Shore Trail. 
the Mohawk Trail. The Mohawk Trail was an extension of the Shore Trail, connecting the Middle West with the Hudson and points east. Not only were there trails to New England, but there was, for instance, a branch of the Mohawk Trail in west central New York going to the old Iroquois town Tioga in northern Pennsylvania, where the Chemung joins the Susquehanna. It was the gateway towards the Chesapeake and Virginia. The Scioto Trail one of the great war paths of Indian history virtually led to and from Michigan. The Scioto Trail branched from the Great Trail and the Shore Trail at their junction at Sandusky Bay and ascended upon the west side to the Sandusky River to the divide and portage between the stream and the headwaters of the Scioto River. It went down the east side of the Scioto for uh, most of the way to the confluence with the Ohio. It crossed the Ohio <clears throat> and joined the famous Warrior's Path across Kentucky to Cumberland Gap. Beyond the gap, by collaterals, <clears throat> it reached the Gulf of Mexico at different points and the southern Atlantic coast. An important trail led into Florida. Over many of these Indian lines went Michigan copper, and in return, shells came <clears throat> from the Gulf. The Potomac Trail the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, east of Parkersburg, West Virginia, follows the old Indian trail and tunnels um, the mountains before reaching Grafton in two places exactly under where the trail crosses the crests. It was a marvel of engineering skill to locate this railroad through and over so rough a country, and when it was completed, it was only a resurvey by men of the tripod of the route the Indians and Buffalo had threaded for hundreds of years before. The Montreal Trail. According to maps of John H. Eddy, 1816, and Thomas Hutchins, 1778, a road which undoubtedly had been a very old trail, coming from Montreal and following the Chicago Trail from Detroit, branched off at Fort St. Joseph and led south to the Tippecanoe River in Indiana and to Prophetstown upon the Wabash. From this village, there was water communication by the way of the Wabash, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers to New Orleans. The length of the, tri length of the trip, as estimated by Eddy, is 1,871 miles. The Mahonig Trail. Beside the Great Trail, there was another leading west from the head of the Ohio River. This was the Mahoning Trail. It followed the north bend of the Mahoning River in eastern Ohio, then went directly west to join the Great Trail near Sandusky Bay. It was the most direct route from Detroit to the forks of the Ohio River. <clears throat> then there was the Sauk or Chicago Trail. There was a trail connecting Detroit with the Sauk town at the confluence of the rock with the Mississippi and Illinois. The old road from Detroit to Chicago follows this route to a point near La Porte, Indiana. It deflects around the head of Lake Michigan and leads on through Chicago to the wild rice fields of Green Bay, the lakes of Wisconsin, and far away to the copper mines of Lake Superior. Article 6 of the Treaty of Chicago, August 29, 1821, states, The United States shall have the privilege of making and using a road through the Indian country from Detroit and Fort Wayne, respectively, to Chicago. As a matter of fact, what has been referred to as the Sauk or Sh Chicago Trail was only a small section and finally branched of a 2,000-mile thoroughfare. Under name of the Montreal Trail, we have mentioned a branch which crossed the Detroit River and went through Canada to Niagara Falls on, and Montreal. That part of this long path that extends through Michigan is now known as the United States Trunk Line 112. Besides the long trails already mentioned, there were intrastate trails that have developed into trunk line highways. At a central point in tracing a few of the Indian paths that have become <coughs> permanent roads leading to and from the Great Lakes, I have taken Detroit, although there is no reason for thinking that was in prehistoric times or any other more importance to tribesmen than some other places in, in Michigan. There was also the Saginaw Trail. The Saginaw Trail extended northwest to the Saginaw River, which, in, which it crossed and then followed the east side of the Tittabwasi at the mouth of the Tobacco River near Edenville upon the boundary between Midland and Gladwin counties. The trail divided. From this ford, one branch led to Houghton Lake in Roscommon. Uh, it curved along the east shore of the lake and then turned west around Higgins Lake.
At the northwest corner of his, Higgins Lake, the trail again divided. One path led to Grand Traverse Bay and the other to Labrie um, from Mackinac. From the ford at Edenville, the east fork of the Saginaw Trail went up the Titabawassee through the center of Gladden County and then led on in quite a direct line to Sheboygan, where it turned abruptly west and met the western branch of the Mackinac Straits. The Dixie Highway from Toledo through Detroit, Pontiac, and Flint follows the Saginaw Trail to where the Saginaw now stands. The Grand, Ri the Grand River Trail the road that leaves Detroit as Grand River Avenue uh, for Grand Rapids follows the course that Indians took for centuries before pioneers pushed into the wilderness of Oakland, Livingston, Ingham, Ionia, and Kent counties. Territorial and Potawatomi um, trails. These were um, two paths that led into Ann Arbor from Ypsilanti, at which point they crossed the Chicago Trail. A trail from southeast Michigan to Saginaw and north. A trail that is uncertain as to exact location through parts of its course led from the southwest part of the state of Saginaw River. North from Saginaw, one may speak more securely of its precise course. One branch leading through the central part of the peninsula has already been delineated. The other followed the Huron shore to Alpena. At Alpena, it followed a few miles um, for a few miles to the Thunder Bay River, past Long Lake, Alpena County, and again struck the Huron Shore about the center of Pre Presqu'isle Isle um, County, and then went on to the mouth of the Sheboygan, where the city of that name stands, and then on to the Straits. <clears throat> there are many other trails um, across Michigan and across the country that are that are, that um, became major. Um, paths of travel for our, our modern highway system. It's interesting to know, to follow that progression from deer and buffalo to um, primitive man here in Michigan, if you want to call that culture primitive, I don't, right up on through, um, you know, our highways today. And so I hope this gives you a little idea of um, the, the ancient paths that we follow throughout Michigan today. Thanks for taking a listen.